Egypt, the public inquiry into the death of Iraqi hotel worker Baha Musa has concluded that the treatment of he and other prisoners was a very serious breach of discipline. Mr Musa died in September 2003, 36 hours after he was sent to a detention centre in Basra and interrogated by soldiers from the Queen's Lancashire Regiment. Sir William Gage announced his findings earlier today. My judgment is that they constituted an appalling episode of serious, gratuitous violence on civilians which resulted in the death of one man and injuries to others. They represented a very serious breach of discipline by a number of members of one QLR. I find that quite apart from the violence carried out on the detainees, the process of hooding them and placing them in stress positions was unjustified and wholly unacceptable. The events of 14 to 16 September 2003 were indeed a very great stain on the reputation of the army and no doubt they did at the time greatly damage some of the good work done by 1QLR and other units in Iraq. Well, the Gage report has made more than 70 recommendations to the Ministry of Defence, including a requirement for ministerial approval before harsh approach interrogations take place, calls for independent inspections of operational military detention facilities, possibly by Her Majesty's Inspector of Prisons, and a right for prisoners to comment on their treatment. Defence Secretary Liam Fox says he's accepted 72 of the 73 recommendations. James Hurst has been studying the detail of the report, its implications and reactions. This is far from the harshest treatment that Baha Musa and his fellow detainees were subjected to. A few hours after their capture in September 2003, Corporal Donald Payne was filmed forcing the men into stress positions while hooded. The inquiry was told it was to condition the men for questioning. Today, the retired judge Sir William Gage said it was completely unacceptable. But there was far worse to come for Baha Musa. When he died the following day, he had 93 separate injuries. He was not the only one to be beaten, but after removing his cuffs and hood, he was subjected to a severe physical assault, which the inquiry found ultimately triggered his death. A violent assault consisted of punches being thrown across the room and possibly of kicks. It also involved an unsold safe method of restraint, in particular being held to the ground in an attempt to reapply plastic cups. Neither cause alone was sufficient to kill him, but the combination of both did. The man blamed for that final assault is Corporal Donald Payne. We can't show his face, and he was not the only soldier to hit the prisoners, but the report effectively brands him the ringleader, calling him a violent bully. In 2007, a court-martial cleared him of manslaughter, but he was jailed for inhumane treatment, the only person to have faced legal redress over the death of Mr Musa. But others are also named as having heavy responsibility for what happened. The platoon's commander, Lieutenant Craig Rogers, is said to have known about the violence but not reported it up the chain of command. Major Michael Peebles, the battle group's internment review officer, is criticised for not properly supervising Payne and his colleagues. Colonel George Mendonca is the most senior officer to be criticised. At the time, he was commanding officer of 1st Battalion, the Queen's Lancashire Regiment. The inquiry says he should have prevented the use of hooding and stress positions and calls it unacceptable that he didn't personally check on the remaining prisoners after Bahamusa's death. Many others face criticism in the report. Today, one soldier who was at the temporary detention facility when Bahamusa was beaten said sorry. Sorry I didn't try that, sorry I didn't speak out. Sorry, I didn't care anymore. Sorry, I didn't go in five minutes before and I might have been still alive. Sorry for everything. It is not just individuals criticised by this report. It says that although hooding and stress positions were effectively banned by Britain in 1972, some soldiers might not have known about it. This information, it says, had become lost in the mists of time, something it calls a corporate failing by the Ministry of Defence. By the time of Optelic, there was no proper MOD doctrine on interrogation of prisoners of war that was generally available. Further, knowledge of part one of the 1972 directive, at the time still operative, and the ban on the five techniques on internal security operations had largely been lost. I conclude that this came about by a corporate failure of the MOD. Today, lawyers spoke on behalf of Bahamusa's family and the other detainees. 
They hope this inquiry may give them another chance for justice in the courts. In light of the cogent and serious findings by Sir William Gage, we now expect that the military and civilian prosecuting authorities of this country will act to ensure that justice is done. The lawyers also plan to challenge some current prisoner handling techniques like this. Restricting this so-called harsh approach is among the 73 recommendations made by the Bahamusa inquiry. I'm accepting in principle all his recommendations with one reservation. It is vital that we retain the techniques necessary to secure swiftly in appropriate circumstances the intelligence that can save lives. The recommendation that we institute a blanket ban during tactical questions on the use of certain verbal and non-physical techniques, uh, I'm afraid I cannot accept. The death of Bahamusa has been described today as a stain on the reputation of the British Army, one that at the time damaged some of the good work done by one QLR and other units in Iraq. The hope of this inquiry and Bahamusa's family is that his legacy will be changes which mean his fatal mistreatment never gets repeated. James Hurst, Forces News, at the Bahamusa Inquiry. Well, the Chief of the General Staff, General Sir Peter Wall, says the Army is determined a similar episode will never happen again. He explained to Derek Tedder his initial reaction after seeing and reading the evidence of what happened to Bahamusa. I think my initial reaction was that this is so shocking and such a stain on our reputation that I didn't want to believe it could have happened. But it's quite clear that it did. And in that context, we um, owe very significant further apologies to uh, the Baha Musa family, and in particular to Colonel Musa, uh, Baha Musa's father, who has participated so constructively in uh, the uh, Sir William Gage inquiry. How can you guarantee this will never happen again? We uh, can never guarantee anything on the battlefield, but we can stretch every sinew to ensure that we've got the best possible checks and balances in place to make sure that our soldiers and officers fully understand the gravity of detention activity and that it can only be done in a controlled and precise environment with the right training and procedures in place. Of course there has been a court-martial into this uh, case. There has been uh, a review commissioned by a previous uh, CGS done by Brigadier Aitken into the way in which the values and standards of the Army are applied on the battlefield, particularly in the detention context. And then most recently the Army Inspectorate has done a, a further review, really in anticipation of today's announcement, to make sure that we can be as confident as possible that we've learnt these lessons and implemented them in all of our training. Uh, most of the lessons uh, originated from uh, Iraq, but of course they've got stark relevance to day-to-day -day operations in Afghanistan. Now, a number of individuals were criticised in the report. What will happen to them? Will any of them face disciplinary action? A lot of people will be expecting the answer to that to be in the affirmative. Well, there's some 26 people who were involved uh, specifically in, the, in, in and around the circumstances of the Bahamusa incident, incident are mentioned by name in the report, 14 of whom are still serving in the army. And we will now commission a review to ascertain how that should be handled. And uh, if investigations need to take place, we will pursue those with, uh, with vigor. General Sir Peter Wall, the current Chief of the General Staff. Well, uh, joining me now, uh, live from Westminster, is Lord Dannett, former Chief of the General Staff. Lord Dannett, thank you very much for being with us on the programme. Uh, appalling violence, breaches of discipline, perverse loyalty and cowardice. These are all phrases heard today that should make the British Army hang its head in shame, shouldn't they? Yes, there's no getting away from it. The uh, report makes absolutely damning reading. Uh, grave and shameful events are described within it. But I think also it's been pointed out that these events were a shocking deviation, that's the expression that's been used, from the normal standards of behaviour of the vast majority of the army. I think that's an important point to, to dwell on, bearing in mind 120,000 of our people served in Iraq and 179 of them lost their lives there. There's no getting away from the terrible things that happened and shouldn't have happened, but the vast majority of our people served in difficult and dangerous circumstances with honour and dignity and bravery. 
That said, what is perhaps most worrying about the report is that it levels criticism not just at the individual soldiers, but the chain of command and the MOD itself for allowing uh, the use of interrogation or not preventing the use of uh, certain interrogation techniques uh, that had been banned for 30 years to take place. There were top to bottom failures, weren't there? Well, I think you've, you've, you've perfectly reasonably, but not quite correctly, conflated two points there. The criticism levelled at the Ministry of Defence of the so-called corporate failure was one going back to the early days of the Northern Ireland campaign, when a number of techniques, five techniques of interrogation, which were used extensively in 1970-71, were banned by the then Prime Minister, uh, Edward Heath. Now, 1972 to 2003 is a long period of time. Soldiers served for 22 years, officers some of them for longer, some of them for shorter. In that period of time, what had been taken as assumed to be banned and past practice had been forgotten. And in the heat and difficulty of Basra in 2003, uh, untrained and unsupervised young soldiers wrongly uh, started to recreate some of these techniques. Now, they shouldn't have done that. Uh, their low-level supervision should have stopped it. Their training uh, should also have, have stopped it. This doesn't in any way excuse it. It somewhat explains what happened. But um, I think the other thing to bear in mind, and it's, it's something for all of us who are in the military or have been in the military to ponder on, yes, there were a number of individuals who carried out this abuse, who attacked these people, put range blows on their bodies. That's bad enough. But there are a number of other people who knew what was going on and chose to do nothing. I think their complete collapse of personal moral courage, of not stepping forward and saying, stop, don't do this, or reporting it up the chain of command, didn't give the chain of command a chance to say, these things have got to be stopped, these things are wrong. So there are several types of failure here, and I think we need to recognise them all uh, and act upon them, as indeed we have been doing for the last few years. So having recognised those failures then, what are we, eight years on, 30 million pounds, 73 recommendations, are we at a position where these sort of situations won't happen again? You can never say they won't happen again, but a tremendous amount has changed in the way that we detain prisoners, how we hold them, the training that goes into special staff to supervise the way that uh, prisoners are, are held and how tactical questioning and interrogation takes place. A lot has changed since 2003 and changed for the better, for the better so that we can better uphold our own standards, which are absolutely critical in places like Iraq and now in Afghanistan. Uh, and also for the protection of the people in our custody. After all, this man died in our custody and we had a duty to protect him, not to kill him. OK, Lord Dana, we have to leave it there, but thank you very much for your time this evening.